Some of you are already familiar with the CCHN. I see a lot of CCHN community members. I also see we have a few guests. So maybe I will just briefly start with introducing the CCHN to those of you who don't know us yet. So to start with, my name is Fiorella Erni. I am the head of operations at the Center of Competence and Humanitarian Negotiation. The CCHN is it's a strategic partnership between the ICRC, WFP, Doctor Without Borders, and UNHCR, and it is our mandate and mission to build a good practice on frontline research on negotiation practices to develop tools and framework that help frontline negotiators in the field. And when developing such tools, we also draw on the expertise from other fields. And this is also why we have this speaker series today. I will talk about this shortly. We provide spaces for exchange of negotiation experience in our peer workshop, which is also the entry level for people to join our community of practice. And we each of these individual clusters. So at the CHN, we're proud and come today, Kurt, who is the first on negotiating with their counterpart, for requests from humanitarian frontline workers who have told us that one of their main challenges is to negotiate with adversarial de facto authorities that can be non-state actors. Um, that make it very hard for us to negotiate with them. So we have made it our mission to bring to you experts from different fields who have experience in this. So Kurt Kinnell, our first speaker. Okay, good, good morning, everyone. First time I, I can introduce myself. I was not scheduled on, on the program, but my name is Taufik and uh, I'm working at CCHN as a curriculum advisor. And um, and so the CCHN is Center of Competence and Management Negotiation. I guess most of you know it and uh, uh, we provide uh, uh, learning experiences and um, and different activities on on humanitarian negotiation specifically, and uh, we often open the windows to uh, other type of negotiation, like hostage negotiation, that uh, Kurt is going to uh, present to you a bit on, on the topic of adversarial negotiation. And uh, and uh, we have a series of of speakers joining us uh, uh, often in in the overseas and community to present different uh, topics and 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 uh, and issues to to the community. So. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm very happy to be here, and I hope you will have a very good time with Kirk. From what I know from Kirk, it's going to be very uh, interesting and, uh, and interactive with all of you. I don't know if I said enough. <laughs> sure. Yeah, you said, at least you said it was going to be interactive, because you weren't expecting to get that this morning, right? So thank you, Tiffany. Oh, I well shouldn't done. have said that. But it, even if it's a, it's a presentation, you're always interactive with people. Mm. Uh, you saved Fiorella with the Wi-Fi, right? So thank you. Thank you, Fiorella. Okay, so listen. Um, from just to take over from where they've left off, just to introduce myself to those of you who've not met me before. I'm the former head of Portage Negotiation in Aram Policing in Scotland. Um, I come here with a background as a hostage negotiator all the way back to as a young constable when I was on the armed response teams and a hostage negotiator all the way through to being a hostage, the head of hostage negotiation. And I worked in, the, of course, the UK team I was the um, lead advisor to US law enforcement on conflict resolution. And I also teach at the HEC in Paris, you know, Harvard Kennedy Business School, Cambridge University, um, St. Gallen University. And so the purpose of that is not about how wonderful am I, right? It's not about that. It's about saying, come here with a perspective that I'll talk about a process that we learned in the hostage negotiation world, which was, for me, over 35 years and in, in the last five, six years in the corporate world and also the humanitarian world, um, we have a process which is 99.9% .9 successful over that period. And we validate that success through 
the use of psychology, academic research. And so we always partner with psychologists and and the academic world to validate the stuff we're talking about, right? So what I'll do is I'll talk about some of the, the definitions this morning, the meanings. I want you to try and interpret that for what it means to you and your world, right? So, of course, I've been across to, to Lebanon and Oman with the, the CCH8 team in, in Geneva and, and different parts of the world. Warsaw last year, you know, over the war in Ukraine. And so I've got a little bit of understanding of the challenges that you face, right? But even for, for my world, and I see Martin Clayworth has joined, Martin's also from that world, we we don't have a clue when it comes to the level of danger that you guys are in because we're in a bubble, right? Not like you guys who are on the ground and, and trying to negotiate food into camps or, you know, Envoy ceasefires and all of the independence of the Red Cross and, and all of the humanitarian aid organizations. So I'll come from this perspective, but the onus is on you to try and adapt that a little bit for what it means for you and your perspective. So with that agreement, we'll we'll have a I'll start the PowerPoint you'll see in the background. Um okay. So the slide number one is really about, I'll transfer some knowledge into skill, the first two areas, right? I'll, I'll present some knowledge to you. Um, we will exercise that. We'll have some fun with that by the end of the session. And for you, it becomes a habit. You have it as a habit anyway. Many of you have been doing this for a number of years. And eventually when you back up, not just the psychology, but with the operational practice, but with the academic research, you can master this topic, right? And it's something that for me in 35 years, I still would count myself as, as a baby, right? I'm just learning a lot of this stuff because it's so wide that, you know, I, I would be loath for anyone in my arena to call themselves experts because I don't think you ever master this. You're always learning. My own company, you know, we have a, a an A to Z of, a process, if you like, it's called the I Resolved process. And I Resolved is a mnemonic for going through, I'll go through it bit by bit. Gathering information, realize the problem you're actually facing, examine and analyze the issues on the table and the people involved in the game, what strategy and tactics we're going to employ, the method of opening dialogue, um, how to listen, understand, and influence the behavior of others, how to validate your assumptions on power and leverage, establish a pro proposal to close the deal, and then debrief. Now, this process is, as I said, it's an A to Z. Um, validate your assumptions on power and leverage, right? I'm writing a book right now called Never Trust Your Instincts, right? And, and it's a bit provocative, but what I mean by that it's always validate your intuition, your instincts, because very often we find there's something else going on in the story, particularly in the world of negotiation, right? And you'll you'll have experienced that many times. The, the main topic today is how to deal with difficult people, adversarial contacts. How do you deal with the problem people in, in your world? And it ranges from, from people who are just awkward or people who are absolutely horrible. And I've spent 35 years dealing with people on that spectrum. So we talk about the, the, the I resolve definition of empathy. What is empathy? You know, we hear people talking about walking in the shoes of others, right? You cannot walk in the shoes of others. It's really about being able to recognize and articulate the emotional state of other people and the context of that. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is, for us, it's about saying, um, you look sad, right? You look happy. You seem to be frustrated. Now, that would be normally what we would call an emotional label. You just label the emotion that you see. But for me, empathy is a lot more deep than that. It includes context, right? And the context is the because. You look frustrated because... You cannot get food into the camp. You cannot get water through to the people who need it, right? That kind of thing. 
So empathy really is about recognise what's going on, but not excluding the context of what's going on, right? So it's a bit stronger than, than what you would normally recognise. Sympathy. Some of us think sympathy is there, 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 right? Give people a hug. It's not. It's actually about sharing a feeling with someone else. You cry, I cry. You laugh, I laugh. And for me, I often share this experience with, with people about when I'm in the presence of my daughter, right? My daughter has an infectious laugh. And when she laughs, I laugh. And sometimes I don't even know what the joke is. I'm not even sure what's funny. But her emotion is infectious. So sympathy is when you're infected by the emotions of others. Many years in the law enforcement area, as a hostage negotiator going to the edge of a bridge, I would feel sad when people were sad or when they were lonely. I would often feel that. And of course, there's a fine line become between becoming an absorber of people's emotions because you have to be able to put maybe um, one foot in their shoes and not two because if you become affected by their emotions too deeply, then you're not able to control your own. And compassion really is about offering support. That's the bit that we sometimes mistake a little bit for sympathy, but it's really when you put an arm around someone and say, how can we help you out of this difficult thing, right? So it's important that we understand the difference between empathy, sympathy, and compassion, because we are working out how the tools that we need to deal with those difficult people, right? So we, at the very least, must be able to understand us and how we connect to other people normally, right? So this is normal functioning behavior, um, how you function with normal, friendly human beings. There are three layers of, of empathy, right? Cognitive empathy. It helps us understand what people are thinking. Emotional empathy helps us understand what they're feeling, right? And it's slightly different. And not to mention compassionate. Right, helps us understand the challenges that they're facing. And you know that when you recognize and say these things out loud, you normally get a response from people. And when you say to someone, it seems to me that you're frustrated because of the volume of your work. And they respond by saying something like, that's right, you're right. Or when you get it, a good connection, and they say something like, exit. Right? It means that. There's a connection there, right? And we want to recreate your ability to connect with people. That engrossed transformational moment when someone says, he just gets me, she just gets me, right? So the hostage negotiators have learned to reverse engineer that progress and that process rather from A to Z and say over a period of time on the average siege in the UK runs between two and six hours. But most good negotiators can establish that relationship in under one hour, right? And then we start to build the picture. So it's understanding the journey and how you do that with a level of authenticity. Of course, you do it anyway, right? I'm, I'm explaining something that you do automatically. But I want you to think about it a little bit differently because I don't want it just to happen. I want you to make it happen. Right. If you're not making it happen, it's just happening by chance. But in the world of negotiation, we have to create it and then make it happen so that we can build sustainable relationships, sustainable partnerships. So right now you should be thinking about the relationships that you have that are really strong and then compare that to the relationships that you have that are not so strong and try and understand What's the difference? What did I do different with that person that I did to that person? Create that strong connection. Mm -hmm. Context. We often look at things through our own prism, right? We, context is really where you set the scene for an event. And we sometimes say, you know, things like, we can see the facial expressions on someone's face and we say, you know, you look sad. But we eliminate the context of that. It might well be that they're sad face, but they're actually lonely because they're sitting alone in a room or or they're maybe just isolating themselves. They're not communicating with people. They don't respond by text. 
but we just ignore these things because we just look at it through our prism and don't recognize the depth of what's going on. So I want you to think about the context that you apply to something. Are you applying the context from your prism or from their prism? And when you look at it through your prism, of course, you will be affected by your own either unconscious or deliberate biases, right? So it's really about self-awareness. And the biggest thing about self-awareness, and we sometimes refer to that as emotional intelligence, well, being aware of your own emotions is only one part of the equation. It's the impact that you have on other people that really matter, right? So emotionally intelligent people think it's okay to say, yeah, I'm, my self-awareness is high. I'm really aware that I can be frustrated. But the better ones understand the impact that they have on other people, right? Understand that you cause people to perhaps be quiet. Perhaps you make people react, whatever the trigger is to other people. So for you in the humanitarian world, when people are obnoxious or they're arrogant or aggressive, what is the impact that they have on you? Or what is the impact that you have on them? You know, an example that I have in terms of my own personal awareness, um, especially when I was the head of the firearms team, I like to think that I was an easygoing, likable, friendly guy. Um, but in terms of the impact I had on other people, sometimes I would walk into a room and people were terrified of my presence without knowing me. And I recognized that maybe it was my persona, my rank, my role, it was having an impact on them. So I had to work extra hard to get them to the place where they felt relaxed. So that's the big difference about my context and their context. No point me just saying I'm friendly if they don't feel it, right? Perception, your perception versus their perception. And we learned in the world of hostage negotiation that people often form a perception of things. And I'll come to that later on, but it's not the same as having a perspective on things. People's perception is built based on what their senses tell them is true. Your truth, my truth. So as an example, if I have a perception of an event, Let's just say I saw something unfold, but you saw something completely different. You'll never change my perception, right? You can change my perspective over time, my point of view, but you can change. You cannot change my perception. You know, we understand from psychology the principle of resistance that the more you try to convince someone that their opinion, their worldview is wrong, the deeper their resolve becomes. Right? We just we, we make them dig in. So we could never try to change someone's perception of an event or a situation. We focus on what we normally do is the perspective. And we make them see different perspectives, but we can only do that when we get to the point of perspective where we understand the perspective of each other, right? You see my point of view and I see your point of view. And we've learned in the world of negotiation, that people will never see your point of view unless they feel heard and understood, right? Heard and understood. They're not open to your solutions until they feel heard and understood. You know the phrase, unexpressed feelings never die? Well, that's about, if they don't get to express their feelings, their context, their view of the world, they'll never be open to yours. It just becomes an argument, right? It becomes conflict. You think A and I think B. You think A and I think B. And all that happens there is the conflict escalates. The difference of opinion becomes polarized. So we learn, shut up and listen. And that's why the listening skills of negotiation is so important, that we shut up from our perspective. And we also learn the benefit that eventually when I do convey my perspective, I can frame it in a way that will be palatable to them. I can frame it in a way that's good for them. But when I do it before they feel heard and understood, I'm literally and metaphorically wasting my breath. It's very easy to approach someone on the edge of a bridge or in a kidnap situation and tell them the solution is surrender, 
you know, or the people on the edge of a bridge. Well, there's an easy solution. Just get a bank loan, pay off your debts, right? But in that moment, they can't even hear you. They can't hear you because when we are stressed, the logical, rational part of the brain is not working. It's only the emotional part that's in overdrive. So compassionate assertion is where we show empathy and compassion to other people. And I know that I'm preaching to the converted because for you in the humanitarian world, being interested in other people is your raison d'etre, right? So what I'm talking about now is probably something that we've learned from you. You care about other people first. You put them first. And so we learn that if you have truly interest in other people, you want to understand their perspective. Instinct, intuition, impulse. We know that instinct is our automatic fight, flight, freeze response. Intuition are those quick feelings, those senses in your gut. And it's just knowing something without knowing, right? And impulse is the sudden urge. And instinct, intuition, and impulse all have one thing in common. The absence of conscious thought. And so negotiators learn, we understand, we'll embrace all of that, but we will not make assumptions of being right or wrong because we recognize that we still have to apply some conscious thought, especially for complex problems. So what happens when human beings start to apply some pressure? You know, how do you deal with the people who are nice, but then there are those who start to apply pressure to you? Those adversarial people that we're here to talk about. And it starts from just expressing a need, making challenging requests, try to influence, manipulate, threats, deadlines, demands, kidnap, extortion, violence, and murder. Now, the whole spectrum there of what of how people can apply pressure to you. Psychology tells us that there are three typical personality types that maximize the advantage when they find a weakness, a vulnerability, or leverage in other human beings. Narcissists, psychopaths, and those from the Machiavellian arena. And we'll describe a little bit of what's going on from the understanding of psychology, a little bit of neuroscience. It's not a psychology lesson, it's not a neuroscience lesson, and it's not a Machiavellian how to operate in the workplace. But we'll talk about the dark triad because Psychology recognizes that these personality types, well, they're actually all very similar, right? And and they actually, the people that we face that make life really challenging for us will come from one of the three categories. But we don't get caught up trying to categorize them. We're not psychologists treating people. We just recognize that their behaviors are very similar. And we focus on the behaviors, not the clinical diagnosis. Personality traits, right? The big five personality types. And I'll reference McCray and Costa, and you can you can read up on this. Scales of one to ten on neuroticism, extroversion, openness, agreeableness, consciousness, conscientiousness. And I don't want to get into this in any level of detail. Um, my sister is a clinical psychologist in Australia. My daughter is a student of psychology, and we have these conversations, but I, I don't want us to start to think that we are junior psychologist of the year. I just want to recognize that all of these things that are researched in, in psychology all point in the same direction. Narcissistic personality disorder is a mental condition where people believe the patient is fine and it's everyone else who needs treatment, right? We will recognize that when you're dealing with these people, they're the ones who try to make you feel there's something wrong with you. And that's what we have to recognize is going on with these three types of personality, all at different levels, of course. So what is the passive aggressive behavior that we see? Well, of course, they lack empathy, right? The one thing, the tools that we use to connect with other human beings, it's really a challenge to connect with them because they lack empathy and they use indirect methods of communication to talk to you. They say maybe, hidden, aggressive, or condescending phrases. Things like, oh, that's an unusual look you have today. It's ambiguous enough for you to feel that it's an insult. 
And of course, if you challenge them, they'll say, I didn't mean it that way, right? Or, oh, bright and early today, meaning that you're sometimes late. They'll infer things ambiguous to provoke a reaction from you, right? So we look at this. What is the meaning that we attach to the smiles we see there? What do they mean? That looks like they're sharing a joke, they're having a laugh, right? Because we interpret the body language, the facial expressions. What's going on with that smile? We can interpret that as something completely different, right? She's maybe under pressure, stressed, or perhaps it's a bit serious. Again, looks like they're having fun, a naughty kind of smile, right? We've got a different meaning for what we see in terms of the body language. And again, I can interpret that she is smiling because she thinks the guy looks so cute with that little puppy in the background, right? She's biting her lip and, and kind of in a, in a nice connotation. You know, Tom and Jerry, let's read the smiles of Tom and Jerry, a famous, you know, Warner Brothers cartoon. But if you misinterpret those smiles, you know, as Tom, uh, Tom and Jerry often do, Jerry walks into the path of an oncoming bus because Tom has set him a trap, right? So it's about what about the traps that people set us? How are we aware of the traps that people set us? And really it's about control versus vulnerability. Are we vulnerable to the traps that people set for us? So the way that we deal with difficult people is to reduce your vulnerability and expectations of them in order to neutralize their control over you, right? So if we can't control them, and I'll talk about why we even shouldn't try and control them. If we can't control them, what we have to do is put a barrier so that they can impact adversely on us. They don't wreck your day. They don't destroy you. How do you actually deal with those horrible, difficult, awkward, narcissistic, jealous, spiteful people, right? And you deal with them in every walk of life. What you can do is eliminate, or at the very least, reduce your vulnerability. And you do that by not compromising on your core values. We talk about people being externally or internally referenced. And if you're externally referenced, you need validation from the outside world. You need 100 likes on your Facebook profile or your Instagram, you need to know that you're valid. But when you're internally referenced, which normally happens to older guys like me, when you get to a certain age where you start to reference yourself internally, and in fact, you judge yourself, you, you reference yourself. So for me, I'm not affected greatly by the way I'm seen by the outside world. I've got some self-belief, which is not the same as self-confidence. Self-confidence is when you validate yourself from the outside world, believing that you have to be pretty or young or, or likable and all of these things. But as you get older, with a bit of wisdom, you recognize, mm, I know who I am. I'll depend on me. Thank you very much. And it gives you a bit more certainty. And I'll talk about certainty and the need for certainty later on when we get to the, the plenary. But we also learn in the world of negotiation that you cannot influence the behavior or emotions of other people if you cannot control or manage your own. So already we can see the theme is that we're learning to control and manage our own emotions or the impact on us. Remember with difficult people, the narcissists, the sociopaths, the psychopaths, you know, the Machiavellian characters in each organization, they are hardwired for reward. They are expressing their needs, right? They don't care about yours. They care about theirs. And it's for us sometimes unconceivable, inconceivable, my apologies, it's inconceivable that people could, could sit in a room, have a conversation with you, but have not the slightest bit of care for what you're feeling or what the impact on you is. Because again, we look at that through our prism and we say, surely they didn't mean that. No one could be that unkind or that, that malicious. But recognize for these people, they are hardwired for reward. They're expressing a need 
to be rewarded every day and you know the traps that they set we feel like the target of that abuse and we're not the target we're the subject of that abuse so what i want you to take from this is not to react to what feels like an attack on you you just happen to be there you are the person where their behavior is aimed at but if you were not in that room and someone else was there someone else would be the subject right so the target of that behavior is about elevating themselves it's not really about putting you down or that's the way we take it that's the way that we receive it as human beings so if i can give an example of transferring that knowledge into a into a practice many times when i was in the law enforcement arena people might come up to me as a young cop and say things like you're nothing but a pig and the truth of the matter is, I recognize they didn't know me. And therefore, their comments should not be about me. Whatever was going on with them was the reason behind their outburst. So for me, it was not to react to that outburst, not to take it personally, but to recognize what's going on with them is going on with them. A volcano has just exploded in front of me, and really it was going to do that whether I was there or not. So when I see inconsistencies in their words, tone of voice, behavior, facial expressions, emotions, that forms a pattern for me of how they like to communicate. And they set traps for you to fall into, right? They'll say provocative things. They'll say they didn't mean it that way. They meant it another way just to get you to react, just to get you to feel foolish or to get you to feel inferior to them. Right. And that's the typical behavior. And that's, of course, that's on a scale of one to 10. Right. How bad are they at that? And we feel attacked by that communication style. Right. We sometimes feel humiliated. We feel insulted. We feel defensive and we feel embarrassed. Right. And and the mnemonic between these four emotions, H-I-D-E, well, we tend to hide. Right. When we are. When we're presented with this type of behavior, we tend to just withdraw into ourselves because we don't want to have public fight with someone who's well-equipped and actually probably has been planning this conflict and deal with it every day, right? We are just not confrontational people. So what do they do? What are the patterns? They criticize others, but of course they're adverse to criticism. They'll react when they're criticized. They are insensitive to your feelings, but are very sensitive about their own. They're very defensive, but don't expect you to be. They're confrontational, but don't like being confronted. They blame you and never take responsibility. They're jealous because they want attention, but they can't recognize your achievements. And they make you doubt yourselves to make them feel strong, right? So I want to recognize that there will be people around us that have this type of behavior right now that we don't really see them as narcissists. It's just we see some awkward or difficult people. So psychopaths, that's viewed as a collection of personality traits on a continuum with normal personality functioning. We don't just categorize people as being psychopaths. It's just that we all have these tendencies. You and I, hopefully, are number one on that spectrum, and the people that are really bad, they are six, seven, eight, nine, ten on the spectrum, because we all have a little bit of self-interest going on. And in us in the negotiating world, we recognize the ego, which is the driver for ambition and success, is not always a bad thing. It's necessary for success. So it's good to have an ego. It's good to have that driving ambition. But we also learn that that has to be balanced with humility. We have to sometimes puncture that precious ego and have humility. And by humility, I don't mean being humble. I don't mean the dictionary definition of humble. For me, humility is something quite different. For me, I have never felt inferior to anyone in my life. But I've never felt superior to anyone in my life. And, and growing up 
those values which you have in abundance, right? You're in this world, you're you're making great progress in the world, then recognize that the humility, that voice in your head that just functions the ego sometimes and stops you getting carried away from feeling self-important. The problem with others, difficult profiles, is they may not have that voice of humility and they start to believe the voice that tells them how wonderful they are every day. So, so sociopath and psychopath, what is the difference? Sociopaths are people who actually have a conscience, maybe a weak one, but they still have one. And the telltale for that is they will justify something that they know to be wrong. They'll say something like, I only did that because, right? And that tells you at least they have a conscience because they're trying to justify something that they know was naughty or bad or wrong. Now, they're easily reachable. If they have a conscience, we can still reach them. Psychopaths, somewhat different, they believe that their actions are justified and feel no remorse for any harm done. And what I mean by that is, if I have a psychopath who has a hostage, and that happened a lot with people with mental illness, and as a negotiator, we would impose our wisdom on their situation often get it wrong because we might feel oh please don't harm the baby with you please keep the baby safe but in actual fact because psychopaths have no remorse no empathy no guilt those words are meaningless to them but when we reframe it and say things to them like if you look after the baby it will be good for you in the long run if you keep that baby safe you will be safe and because self-interest is the top of their goal, then they are more likely to take care of the baby. And we can use that style of communication to achieve our goal, which, of course, is keeping the baby safe. But we recognize that then being hardwired for reward and self-interest, that's their primary goal. Right? So appealing for their compassion is just not going to work. So again... I'll send the slides on for everyone that you can see. I don't really want this to be, you know, a, a lesson in all of the details or the or the categories, but you can see that they're low in trust. The psychopaths are high in assertiveness, pretty much identical to the narcissist, and again, pretty much identical to the Machiavellian people. They just operate in different environments, and Machiavellians tend to operate in governments or in large organizations where they move people around to keep control. And indicators of grand, grandiose narcissism, aggressive, dominant, arrogant, lack of empathy, exaggerate their self-importance to the need for recognition, very self-confident, insensitive, disregarding feelings to others, needing praise, adoration, manipulative, controlling behavior. All the things that we recognize. And what they do is they give instructions rather than requests. They try to intimidate people. They blame people all of the time. They're dishonest with themselves. And they believe that they know more than you. And they keep secrets, right? So these are things that we should not challenge, right? We don't want to have a battle with them on their home turf. What we want to do is invite them to our turf. And what they do is they minimize their flaws, their own vulnerability. They're dishonest about their mistakes. They're dishonest about themselves. And they don't trust other people. So how do we maximize? Or how do they maximize our vulnerability? They threaten you. They make demands of you. They put deadlines on you. They have no concept or understanding of your reality. And they try to expose your vulnerabilities. They'll say things like, if you don't get this done for me, I'll blame you, and it's your fault that I harm the baby. Under pressure, some people can start to become stressed, but we recognize this is just a tactic by narcissists. They recognize that you have compassion, and that's a weakness in this circumstance. So how do we avoid people dealing with narcissists? We don't compare them to others. We don't say, one person was kind, you should be like them, right? We don't do that kind of thing. Or we don't play their game or give them control. We don't justify ourselves to anyone. 
or we, you know, we defend yourself, showing them you've got doubts. Because if you start to do that, that they make them realise they're gaining some access, they're winning. We can stay strong without arguing and don't allow them to have a hook in you. Right, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll I'm not going to go through the tactics, right? I'll I'll send you these slides that you can you can look at later on, right? But we're at the point. I'm just going to end the slideshow that stops sharing. Um, I'll send these slides on, but I don't want it to become a a psychology lesson or a definition of all of the personality traits. What I want you to recognize or take from this is that when someone gets you to react, that's when they have some tactical advantage. You know, and, and usually when we use empathy and the skills that we've learned, we can use phrases like, it seems to me that you're angry because of A, B, and C. Or I get the impression that you're frustrated because of A, B, and C. So here's an example. Someone comes to you in your place of work, and they shout violently in your face. And they say something like, I will never call you again. You're never reliable. You're always letting me down. And that feels like an attack on us. It looks like an attack on us. But we should not take it as an attack. We should use that to step back, exercise what's going on with them, and just demonstrate some empathy and say, Something like, it seems to me that you're frustrated because you've not had personal contact or that you don't feel valued, right? And when you get that, yes, that's us getting a connection with them. We're in a place of agreement. Even if we agree about our difference, we're not in conflict with them, right? It's our job is to get them to shout yes. Exactly, you're right. So the method by which we have connection with them it's not the way we perceive at the beginning of the session where when you can recognize and articulate the emotions of other people when you get agreement for that transformational moment where he gets me, she gets me, they'll tell you you get them when they're still dumping all of that energy right in front of you. So really the important thing is to recognize that the energy will be dumped right in front of you. You should not take it personally. You should reduce your vulnerability by separating you from what's happening in front of you. Attach yourself to the story. When someone comes and says, you know, it's not fair. They always get their way. You know, and you can step back and say, it seems to me that justice is important to you. And on this occasion, you feel that you're, you're not being heard. Yes, exactly. So even though that outburst of emotion the volume of words, we could receive that personally. We could say things like, no need to be rude, no need to shout. But when we do that, we are showing them that we are susceptible to their control. Right. So it's really about learning to deal with the aggression, learning to deal with the noise. And all we do is focus on the behavior, focus on the context of their behavior and disassociate yourself from that. Become part of the story. They're planning on you becoming part of the story so that they can flip it later on. So all we do is we learn not to do that. And so in your world, when you have people who perhaps will not allow you access to camps, they will maybe tell lies. Sometimes in your world, they might claim to have a mandate without having a mandate because they're trying to make themselves grandiose in that, in that context, in that environment. So it's to help you think about being better prepared for dealing with those narcissists. And really, as we start to open up for the question and answer session, um, it would help me to just understand a little bit more of your perspective, right? Let's have a conversation about things that you face. And we'll talk about how my advice would be how to deal with that, right? So the, the, the PowerPoint slides give us some categories of people. There are some words that help us connect and try and understand the A to Z of understanding empathy and how to connect with someone who lacks empathy. But we'll never get the type of connection with them that we want with other people. So that really, for me, 
the theme of this is stop trying to get that type of connection. Just deal with the behavior in front of you and don't try to connect with that, but also don't allow that to affect you. You know, and, and sometimes when you've been in this world and doing the job that you're doing for a, a long time, you can let this thing, type of behavior, get under your skin. And the people who treat you like this depend on that because they can exploit your vulnerability, they can manipulate you, and it helps them get their way. So we just learn to use those tactics that, so that we're immune from their control. And we do that by, of course, reducing our vulnerability and the way we are susceptible to that influence.